Hey everyone, this is Matthew Kent, and welcome to the Theology on the Ground YouTube channel. And so today I want to talk about one of the most important topics out there, um, the necessity for Christians to have the Bible uh, as their highest court of authority. Now, here's the deal. Putting my cards on the table, I have for 10 years read the Bible every single day, uh, almost without fail. I've missed a few days, but... The, 99.9% .9 of days I've I've read my Bible and I do this out of a deep unshakable conviction that this is the Word of God and that my life has been far better having read it known what he says and tried to implement it than it would have been had I neglected this critical habit so the bottom line is there's two different ways that a person in general could attempt to start to think about God. One of them would be by looking to divine revelation. God reveals himself to you. The other would be through your own speculation. So you just kind of philosophize or theorize about who you think God is and how you think he's like. Unfortunately, speculation really doesn't work too well. You are a finite created being and we're created in God's image. And so we're not supposed to then go around and say, okay, well, here's how we are. Here's how we identify. And that must be how God is. Rather, we should ask, what is God like? And then how are we to understand ourselves in light of that revelation from God? So when I talk about divine revelation, God has revealed himself at many times and in many ways throughout human history. So one area that he's revealed himself is just general revelation, right? It, it doesn't get into specifics, but that would just be through the, the created order. Creation implies a creator. So the fact that you look out and that there's something rather than nothing, the fact that there's order rather than chaos, clues all of us in that there, there's a creator. If I were to walk outside right now and stack, um, or not stack, but line up a set of leaves, just 10 leaves, all in a perfectly straight line, and then I were to take you outside and I were to say, hey, look at this line of leaves. How did that happen? Was that chance? Uh, or did somebody do that? If you're not crazy, you would say, somebody did that. And <laughs> you'd be right, I did that. Uh, in the same way, you look out at creation and you think, my gosh, this is way more ordered than a line of 10 leaves in a row. This was not chance. Somebody did this. And that somebody is God. Uh, God has revealed himself more specifically throughout history. He's revealed himself through the prophets. Um, he's revealed himself in the incarnation of the Son of God, right? God became a man, Jesus Christ entered into human history in the incarnation and became like one of us. So that's all well and good for people who, who lived back in the time of the prophets, who lived back in the time of Jesus. But for us, you know, sitting here years later, what about us? How do we get to know God if we don't have those forms of divine revelation available to us? And so that's where the Bible really comes in. So how did God preserve that special revelation, that divine revelation for us. And it's through the Bible, it's through having a record of what he's done, what he's said, how he's interacted with humanity in the past, right? We have this collection of 66 books of the Old and New Testaments, and uh, basically they record God's dealings throughout human history up until uh, the early church. And we have the, the teachings and the instruction uh, meant for our sakes, meant for our benefit uh, from God so that we know how to live. We know what the gospel is. We know all of the essential things that we need to know. It doesn't tell us everything we want to know, but it certainly tells us everything that we need to know uh, for the sake of living a godly life that is pleasing to God and helpful and beneficial to others. So real quickly, I just want to mention this fact that, you know, there can be other courts of authority and certainly, you know, we, we 
wholly support the sciences. We wholly support all forms of, of learning. And so, you know, if you're sick and go to a doctor, right, they're going to have the best answers for you. Um, but the Bible is our, our highest court of authority. And on uh, matters to which it speaks, it speaks authoritatively and, you know, is unchallenged. It doesn't tell us how to change a transmission, so don't look to the Bible for problems like that. Um, but it does tell us how to, you know, inherit eternal life. So this is where we go for those answers, not anywhere else. And this is really important because there are some traditions, and the Catholic faith comes to mind here, um, that will claim that they have multiple courts of authority. So, okay, we, the Bible is one of our courts of authority, but then we also have, you know, holy tradition, and uh, we've got the, the Holy Church, which essentially means the, the Pope. Now, that, that sounds really good and okay. You know, we, we look back to tradition, and there's nothing wrong with looking back to tradition, and there's nothing wrong even with having a leader. Most churches have pastors. The problem is, anytime that you say you have multiple courts of authority, really you only have one. And when any of the three come into conflict, there's going to be one that's the final arbiter that resolves the issue and and settles everything for you. It's going to be the one that you follow. And for the Catholic Church in particular, uh, it's become pretty clear that the, the church gets the right to define which traditions they look to as authoritative and which they don't. Um, the church gets to define what the proper translation what the proper interpretation of the Bible is. So at the end of the day, when you think about the Catholic Church, they say that the Bible is one of their highest courts of authority, but really it's not like when I say the Bible is my highest court of authority. I mean the Bible is the final arbiter that I go to to decide all other issues. For them it's like, well, we go to the Bible until the Pope says, no, that wasn't the right interpretation, and, and then we follow the Pope. So really, at the end of the day, you can only have one. You can't have, well, we've got three sources of authority. We've got four sources of authority. We've got 12 sources of authority. You get one final source of authority. For most people in most contexts, that final source of authority is themselves. A lot of religious folk have other final forms of authority, the Quran, the Book of Mormon, uh, the Pope, whatever it is, one of the things that distinctively sets Christians apart is the Bible as the highest court of authority. So, you know, that being said, that doesn't necessarily mean that the Bible, based on what I just said, needs to be your highest court of authority. It means you, you can only have one. But, you know, why should a Christian choose the Bible as theirs. And uh, to, to start out my sort of argument for that, and really I think that the most crucial point in my argument is just going to be because of Jesus, right? So ultimately for Christians, I mean, what it means to be a Christian, the very word Christian means that you're, you're a follower of Christ, you're a follower of Jesus. And Jesus, who the Bible calls the Word of God, uh, Jesus, who is God incarnate, uh, have what we would call a high view of Scripture. In other words, he looked to the Bible as the very um, inspired words of God. And so to, to see that, let's check out what Jesus said. The first passage I want to look at is Matthew chapter 19. And Jesus is having an interaction with the Pharisees. So I'm starting in verse 3 here. Some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now there's two really critical things to notice here. The first is that when they come to him with a question, his answer is not, I say to you, or here's the correct answer. His answer is, have you not read? So his expectation is, you have the Old Testament scriptures. You 
have everything you need to determine this answer. The second really critical thing, and this is so subtle, but it's there in the original languages, he says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and these two little words, and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now that quotation that he's um, quoting there comes from Genesis 2.24. So if you've ever you know, done a, a study on what the Bible teaches about marriage, that verse is obviously foundational. And uh, in the text of Genesis 2, there's no indication that Moses, in writing that, is quoting God. Moses is just writing what happened. But Jesus is attributing it to something that God said. So in Jesus' mind, if it's in the Bible, if it's in the Old Testament, it, it might as well be the very words of God. Because for Jesus, the Bible is the highest court of authority for human beings in terms of uh, who God is, what he's like, and uh, how we should take our stance on these important issues. The next passage is just a couple chapters later. If you have your Bible and you want to flip to uh, Matthew 22. So this is Jesus again, and now he's talking to a different group, the Sadducees. And, you know, one of their big things is, hey, only the first five books of the Bible are valid, and we don't believe in the resurrection. And, okay, so here they they come and they, they, they challenge Jesus, and they're asking him, um, you know, if a woman gets married and her husband dies and then she marries his brother and marries his brother because that brother died, etc. Um, in the resurrection, whose, whose wife will she be? Because, you know, all eight of these brothers uh, had her as a wife. And so here's Jesus' answer from Matthew 22, 29. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Now, a lot of critical things are going on here. The first thing is, again, you have this aspect of what was spoken to you by God. Now, in the passage in question that Jesus is quoting this time, it is God speaking. In the Old Testament, it is a, a quotation from God. But it's critical here that for Jesus, that's an authoritative quotation. You can look back at the Old Testament saying that God said this, and Jesus said, yes, God really did say that. So Jesus regards the Bible as reliable in that respect. Um, the other thing to notice here is his first statement, you are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God. Just how closely those words are connected, the scriptures and the power of God. And the final thing to notice here, and this is crazy to me, uh, Jesus based his whole argument to this group of people off of the tense <laughs> of a verb. Right, so you know when we talk about the doctrine of verbal plenary inspiration, which is a mouthful, um, but it means the very words of Scripture themselves are inspired. Jesus believed that to such a degree that he could say, uh, "No, no, no! You see how God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are dead." Well, that verb is present tense, so he's still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob aren't dead and gone; they're you know, with God. So when you can make your entire argument off of a tense, of a verb uh, in the Bible, you have what would be called a high view of Scripture. And so that's the view of Jesus, is a, a high view of Scripture. So moving on here, um, you know, what about the rest of the New Testament? Because here's the deal. That's great for the Old Testament, like, okay, well, you know, 39 books of the Old Testament, Jesus seemed to view them as, as authoritative. Um, but, you know, most of the New Testament, all the New Testament came, came after the life of Jesus. So, you know, what about that? Uh, well, the first thing to notice is that the New Testament has things to say about the rest of the New Testament. And in each and every case, it regards the rest of the New Testament as divinely inspired 
scripture. Um, so I'm going to take you to a passage from Paul. It's going to seem really, really weird why um, I'm going to this passage, but you just got to trust me on this one. So this is from 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18. So, uh, and I shall start in verse 17. He's talking to elders or pastors, um, the, the, those in charge of the, the, the church, the local church. He says this, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox when he is threshing and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Okay, now, the argument that he's making in general is that, hey, there's multiple places in the scriptures that we should know that elders deserve to get paid. And so one of them, and it seems like an odd quote, but he quotes from the Old Testament law, and he says that, you know, hey, even in the Old Testament law, you know, if, if an ox was, was threshing, if he was treading out the grain, you know, then don't muzzle him. He deserves to, you know, be eating from the grass because if he's working, you know, let him eat, let him earn his living. And so if even the oxen, you know, get to earn their living while they're working, then a pastor who is working, doing the Lord's work, certainly deserves to be paid. The second quote, though, always worried me. So I, when I first read that, I was reading from the New American Standard Bible, which is what I'm reading from now. And one of the, the helpful features of the New American Standard Bible is that it will put Old Testament quotations in all caps so that you can recognize them readily and easily. And so that, that first quote was from the Old Testament. It was in all caps. We're fine. The thing that worried me was that the second quote, the laborer is worthy of his wages, um, is not in all caps. So it's not from the Old Testament. And when I first read that, I'm like, oh no, is he is he quoting, you know, some kind of deuterocanonical, you know, apocryphal book and, and calling it scripture? Because he, he prefaced those two quotations with, you know, for the scripture says. So, you know, whatever he's quoting there, he regards as, as scripture. Well, it turns out that what he's quoting is the words of Jesus recorded in Luke 10, 7. Right? So Jesus is sending out the, the 70 disciples, I believe, and, and he's giving them instruction. And, you know, he tells them to, to stay in the house and offer whatever's eaten to them. And he says, because... A laborer deserves his wages, and that's what Paul is quoting here. And Paul calls it scripture, right? And the very word scripture, you know, literally just means something that's written down. Um, by the time Paul's writing, right, it obviously has this connotation of, you know, even in Romans, I think the phrase appears, the, the holy scriptures, um, the graphes hagios in Greek, something like that. So anyways, he's talking about something that's written down, and he's talking about something that's written down in the Gospel of Luke. And so Paul regards the Gospel of Luke as scripture, and you would have to assume that, you know, Luke is a two-part book. You have the Gospel of Luke, and then you have the, the, um, the book of Acts, the, the story of the, low, the early church. And if you don't believe that those two are, are part one and part two, you know, just read the first few verses of the Gospel of Luke and read the first few verses of the Gospel of Acts, and, you know, that'll sort of clear that up to you. So, you know, and actually that's a a large part those are two of the, the longest books they might be the two longest books um I, I, i'm pretty sure the gospel of luke's the, the longest book in the new testament so that that takes care of the the longest couple of books in the new testament that you know paul um you know one of the the apostles not one of the original 12 but certainly you know one of the, the great apostles of the early church um and one of the major figures in christianity believed that that those two books were divinely inspired scripture. And so later on, you know, in, in the very next book, you know, we were looking at 1 Timothy 5 there, in 2 Timothy, you know, where he talks about all scriptures inspired by God, we know that he has Luke and Acts in mind in, in that situation. Uh, so, okay, but I mean, you know, what about Paul in general? Um, well, one interesting thing about Paul is that Peter, right, you know, the the... One of the 12, one of the original 12 apostles, you know, traveled with Jesus during his ministry and sort of was, was singled out um, as sort of being preeminent among the rest. Uh, Peter regarded the writings of Paul as scripture. And so to see that 
if you just want to flip to the book of 2 Peter, and we're going to be looking in chapter 3 and starting in verse 15. So Peter is saying to regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, there's our guy, according to all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which some of these things <clears throat> are hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. So, okay, let's talk a little bit about what's happening there. And first of all, I just have to say that I love the fact that Peter, this fisherman, talking about Paul, this educated guy, Peter's like, yeah, guys, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes Paul's hard to understand. He used a lot of big words. Um, but look, his writings are scripture. And he says that the, the untaught uh, and unstable distort Paul's writings as they do the rest of the scriptures. And he says this, to their own destruction. So he, not only is Paul's writing scripture, but Peter has such a, a high thought of it that like, look, if you twist the writings of Paul, you do so uh, to your own destruction. So there you have Peter who, you know, I mean, next to Jesus, um, you know, Peter and Paul are kind of the big shots of the New Testament. They're imperfect sinners, right? Peter, we get a lot of that. We see him um, denying Christ three times, obviously, is one of the big ones. But, you know, he's just, uh, <laughs> he's, he's a piece of work. He needs a lot of help, saved by grace through faith. But nevertheless, I mean, these are two men that God entrusted, you know, with taking care, really, of the early church. And they've taken care of future generations of the, the church by recording faithfully the word of God for us so that we may be sure about the things um, that we're being taught. Now, okay, what about the rest of the Bible? Because, I mean, that that's actually most of it when you think about it. If, if you know, we're pretty sure that Peter, who was, you know, in Jesus's inner circle, is, is writing scripture, then that's the two books of you know, first and second Peter, we're pretty sure our Bible. And if Peter is writing scripture and he says Paul's writing scripture, and that's all of Paul's letters, which are, you know, the majority of the books uh, of the, the New Testament, you know, all of them are, are fairly short. There's a couple pretty long ones, Corinthians, first Corinthians, second Corinthians, Romans are, are kind of long, but there's some really, really short ones, you know, Colossians, Philippians, that kind of thing. So, but that's all scripture. Paul thinks that Luke, is writing scripture so you know the gospel of luke uh the book of acts which are two of the, the biggest books of the new testament and you know already you've got a majority of the new testament that you know we can be sure you know is is divinely inspired um scripture well and if we're going you know along those lines then you have to think about the apostle john um and so he was also sort of in that that inner circle you know with Peter and you know a lot of times you would have uh, it mentioned that you know Peter and James and John were, were sort of singled out you know with Jesus you know they were the ones who uh, were at the transfiguration um, with Jesus you want to look at Mark chapter 9 I think it's you know around verse 2 or uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane Mark chapter 14 uh, these were the guys that Jesus singled out these were the guys that Jesus um, brought with him you know, in some of these critical moments. And so if we're, if we're thinking Peter is, is you know, an apostle who's, who's writing stuff that we can rely on, who's writing scripture, we got to think that John is too. And so then you get the Gospel of John on, you know, he also the book of Revelation. And also, you know, he wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. So that's five different books right there. Two of them are really, really long. Um, and, you know, one of them is one of the four Gospels. So we've got, you know, two of the Gospels knocked out, um, you know, most of the New Testament. You also consider the fact that the Gospel of Matthew is one of the apostles of, of Jesus. So, okay, hey, that one's reliable. Um, then you think about Mark. And, okay, Mark maybe didn't know Jesus. Maybe he did. You know, probably he didn't. Um, but, you know... It, it, it goes down that he was the, the traveling companion of, 
um, of Paul. Um, potentially, he knew, you know, Peter. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's it's reasonable. It's, you know, something that I don't think is a huge leap of faith to look at Mark and, you know, say, hey, this, this is Scripture. And then you have the fact, obviously, you know, outside the Bible that, you know, the, the early church regarded all these four Gospels as, as Scripture. But I'm trying as much as possible to just, for the moment, uh, look at the, the internal witness of the Bible and to say, you know, hey, how from the Bible do we know about, you know, some of these things? Um, so then you have a couple other books. You know, you have James and you have Jude. Um, these are written by the brothers of Jesus. So if you look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, and, um, you know, uh, Jude in that uh, verse is referred to as Judas, or maybe Judah, depending on your translation, right? The, the Greek variant would be Judas. Um, the, the real name would be Judah, which is the, the, the Hebrew name. And, um, you know, sort of what happens later, I think, when the book of Jude is is written and uh, it gets titled after its author, is that you don't want to name a book Judas, right? Because Judas Iscariot is the guy who betrayed Jesus, and so you don't want to make that confusion. And, you know, even in the Gospels, when they, they talk about other people named uh, Judah um, or Judas, they, they a lot of times will, you know, distinguish. You know, I remember in one place, and I don't remember where it says, you know, Judas, comma, not Iscariot, comma. You know, in other words, like, hey, don't don't get it twisted. We're talking about a guy named Judas here, but we're not talking about Judas Iscariot. Same thing with Jude. Um, he's referenced as Judah or Judas, um, but then the book gets called Jude. So, I mean, that really leaves only the book of Hebrews, which is the, the, the book that we don't know who wrote it. Um, and I would just submit to you, you know, read the book of Hebrews, read how high of a view it has of, of Christ, of who he is. And um, I mean, the whole book of Hebrews is basically like, Jesus is better than fill in the blank. Jesus is better than everything. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than the Old Testament sacrificial system, the priesthood, whatever. Jesus is better. Um, so I, you know, just thinking about what we have in the Bible itself, you know, it seems that we can be pretty confident in the Bible that, hey, this thing really is what God left us as revelation of, of who he is, um, of what he's like, you know, and then you add in different historical facts like, hey, these are the books that we have, you know, a billion copies of. It's obviously an exaggeration, but, um, you know, these were the books that they thought were worth copying. These are the books that, you know, there's no major controversy around them. Um, these are a lot of the books, too, that, you know, they're not, you know, when historically they're dated, you know, these are not, you know, Gnostic gospels of centuries later. Um, so there's, there's, there's evidence outside the Bible that would, you know, lend us more confidence as to like, hey, we, we do have the, the legit revelation from God here in the Bible. Um, but for me, you know, and, you know, you could call it a, a circular argument, but at the end of the day, the, the best way that we have of knowing about Jesus is through what's recorded in Scripture. And we want to go with what Jesus said. So... We look to the Bible, and then Jesus himself validates the Bible. And so it just kind of becomes this thing where, you know, in a lot of ways, the Bible becomes a self-validating um, thing. And at the end of the day, right, if if, if nothing is self-evident, <laughs> then nothing is evident. If you can't ever get to the bottom of anything, then the, there is no bottom, there is no truth. And so you got to start somewhere as your foundation. And I don't think anybody has ever been led astray uh, by starting with the Bible as their foundation. So if you're in a position, you're a Christian, and you have a, a low view of Scripture, or you know, you're not really sure what your so source of authority is, or you, know, you follow the church or the teachings of your pastor, whatever, don't have a habit of daily Bible reading, I encourage you, get a Bible. You can use an app. I sometimes read the Bible on an app. I like having a physical Bible in my hands. I don't know why. Um, even in this video, when I was just talking directly to the camera, I made sure I had a Bible in my hand just because I feel like <laughs> I need a Bible in my hand just to feel confident speaking. I, don't, I can't even explain that. But get a Bible, develop a habit of reading it daily, think about what Jesus had to say about the Bible, and uh, I hope that you in time come to look at it as the, the highest court of authority. Blessings.